Hello, let's continue with the 17th century. We're going to cover a little bit more of cavalier men and cavalier women. Can't be bothered. I'm cavaliering. Now, the English King Charles I, who was uh, what it, to England what Louis XIV was to France in fashion, popularized this look, but he did kind of refine it for um, a, a monarch. Close the doublet. Very nice peplum attachments. You can see there the cannons here become these little refined lace dangly bits there. Um, I think those are points, actually. Also, he added leather riding gloves, which doesn't look like much, was, but was a big fashion forward statement. Uh, rowel spurs, you can see here, it's different than prick spurs. Prick spurs are like the Western spurs that have those little wheels. These are rowel. They're just a they're just a little nub. And then this is very indicative of the period. Also, the quatrefoil spur strap right here. You can see it just goes on over the wine boot. It's got four lobes. One, two, three, one, two, three, and four. Quatrefoil spur strap. Look for that a lot. You're going to see it a lot in this period. Okay, now Louis the Thirteenth, he also adapted the cavalier look, but because he's French, it's a little bit more over the top. You can see there, falling band decorated with lace edging, a tabard worn, right? Remember the tabard over a shoulder carried on the arm, a doublet often left open at the peplum area. And you can see very fancy breeches, very nice cannons, and lovely um, quatrefoil spur strap sometimes in contrasting colors with the um, bucket top boots. How about some other variations on the upper class? <clears throat> we have the scallop gorget. We have these individual peplum panels called basques tied onto the point by the doublet. Now, I know that some of them before have tied on separately, but these are a little bit finer. Um, they're adapted from the, the Spanish. They're overlapping. So basically just, you know, this particular type of, you know, it, it's a style of peplum. A baldric decorated boot hose, which um, is decorative edging, hoses with decorative ed edging, which is known as passamentary, and then a decorative line on, on the bucket top boot. So just to clarify, he pulled the boots down. He's got this lining. This is the inside of the boot. This is the boot hose right here. Just kind of tucked. It's actually, I believe, tucked up under the breeches and then pulled down to show the edging, the passamentary. Passamentetti, if you want to Frenchify it a little bit. Okay, so as we get closer and closer to the Baroque era, the late 17th century, um, moving into that, it starts to get some changes. The doublet undergoes some changes. We see the falling band come, collar become the fichu collar. This will be around for a long time, which is basically a falling band collar that is more decorated. Lots of passamentary there, you can see, which is basically the, the lace edging. You can see the sleeves are slashed. Bing, right here. And this is something you see, Brandenburg braiding. You're going to see more of this, these front closures. This is from Germany. Let's look that closer. Brandenburg braiding. First used by the German military. A number of threads braided together in a loop twisting style. Usually set up to be decorative over a pair of epaulets or said closures on front of a jacket. So you see a lot of very military looking Brandenburg braiding. <clears throat> hats. Let's talk about hats for a while. The cavalier hat. Wide floppy brim. If you were wearing a leather feather, or excuse me, if you were wearing a large feather in it, that is your panache. Also hair, long, curled with a longer lock in front and tied with a ribbon called the love lock. Usually with a ribbon from your assigned lady. Mm. Beards were fashion of Charles I, very popular, known as a la royale. We now call them Van Dyke beards because they are very popular in portraits by Van Dyke. So the a la royale or the Van Dyke. Women's wear in the Cavalier period. Uh, at the beginning of the 20th century, the wheel farthingale was still being worn over a corseted bodice. Stiffened whisk collars, also worn by women, as you can see in this picture. Here's a little girl with a falling rough collar and a bodice with a peplum. These could be bass, you could say, because they're overlapping. And they have what looks like gimping as well. As the century progressed, women's fascists did incorporate masculine cavalier 
uh, elements, such as the epaulets on the sleeve caps of the bodice, stiffened, peplum lengthened, and very full skirts. Eventually, the farthingale, um, that sort of thing, the, the, the wheel farthingale, Spanish farthingale, uh, will be abandoned as the skirts become very fuller, they kind of stand out on themselves. <clears throat> The stomacher becomes more incorporated into the bodice. Remember that. Here we see sleeves become more and more puffed and padded. This is a virago sleeve, which is a sleeve tied into a series of smaller puffs. And uh, the overcurt, uh, excuse me, this petticoat overskirt combo involves into two separately designed peach pieces, usually contrasting, each standing on its own merit. Now this will become popular. Overskirt, underskirt is going to be prevalent for quite some time now so get used to it in fashion forward france they were known as the modeste and the secre outer skirt of course is the modeste inner skirt the secre so you hear me say modeste secre combo and it is it's a combination like a three seat piece suit right you can mix and match you can do this with underskirt overskirt modeste secre and this example a popular variation is to, to Pin up your modeste to show a decorated secre underneath. Look at my secret. Isn't it pretty? Cavalier fashion women's clothing. Doublet-like bodices. Fichu collars. Here we see a puffed and somewhat slashed uh, sleeve. See, it has kind of a, look, a doublet cavalier look to it. Here's an interesting variation. We have um, a low round neckline. Necklines will get lower, after, particularly after the res res restoration in England. It happening at the same time in France where there's this sort of loosening up of morales and social mores where it is more, it's okay for the decolletage to drop. So here we see a low round neckline, a neckline, a plum and plunging stomacher, excuse me. A modeste that is basically an open robe. You can see it looks like she's wearing a jacket here along this line. That's the modeste, and the secre is right under the stomacher. So interesting. And decorated with gimping. Here we see a full length cloth modeste with slash sleeves pinned up to show. A secre with gimp trim, falling band collar. And then a mask, not because she's going to some secret assignation, it's to protect her from the sun. Some are for secret assignations, but some are just to protect you from the sun. Here we see by the mid-century, the overskirt becoming almost an open, well, not almost, it's an open gown tied at the waist. And you see the stomachers turn to this little tongue there, stiffened tab, very puffed sleeves. You can see just puffed up, padded. The decolletage is low again, and it's either scround, round or square. Most characteristic hairstyle of the period was to pull the hair back into a chignon and the front curled into ringlets. Hats included a tall beaver felt hat, a simple coif, as shown at the far right, and then a more feminine styled cavalier, which isn't as floppy as you can see in the lower right. Also a nice panache. Quick, especially costumes of the cavalier. Uh, we're putting in here the Puritans, thanks to Mr. Cromwell and others, Protestants who would come across the oceans to practice religious freedom. Uh, you, we do put this in because this is very big in period pieces of the New World of North America. You can see the man has an extended doublet. We will call this a waistcoat, waistcoat, waistcoat but waistcoat if you're English. And waistcoat sounds better, so we want to say waistcoat. Very distinctive appearance, that wide belt and the knee breeches and a dark, tall hat. We see here a young woman with a simple overskirt, really just a pull overskirt, white cuffs and a coif and an apron with a, uh, an attractive looking red capelet with a falling band collar. Another trapeture later in the century, they do get a little more cavalier, those Puritans. Look at that woman there with that plunging stomacher, attached skirt, steeple crown hats. Man wearing a cape with a falling band collar. Pep, his doublet is open at the peplum level. Come on, pastor. Children around. Crikey. Louis the Thirteenth, wearing a sleeve doublet and ornamental black armor over breeches. Very, you can see the detail in the leather. You can tell that's white supple leather on his boots and on his quatrefoil spur straps. 
a lace fichu and a very fancy baldric with a sword which you can see and that is a kingly thing obviously we have to talk about the three musketeers um they are what we think of today as the um chief representatives of this era uh they wear the customary doublet falling band collar breeches bucket top boots and a wide baldric for their fencing swords it's kind of ironic they're called the musketeers but in most popular fiction and movies and things they are known more for their sword work in the king's service they wear a tabard with the symbol of the king embroidered in the front usually it was gold velvet or blue velvet lastly charles the first uh here's the painting of van dyke van dyke hence the van dyke beard cavalier dress sort of bucket top boots red velvet breeches and um, a very uh, gold silk doublet and that is it for the cavalier period um, for the next one part c we will dive deep into the baroque fashion period uh, prepare yourselves it is completely different thank you